everyone. I'm happy to welcome um, Dr. Ben Rappaport to our course this week. Um, he'll be talking to us today about innovation in neurosurgery, and at least I think so, and um, and uh, our Sinai Biodesign program, which is really, uh, I think, a unique program among uh, medical schools in, in terms of fast-tracking clinical ideas um, mixed with other sort of more basic scientific ideas into the, into the mainstream. And Dr. Rappaport will do a much better job of describing their role in their activities. Um, but he has um, quite a pedigree having trained at, at Harvard and then joining me at uh, New York Presbyterian Cornell uh, for neurosurgery residency, where we were residents together and then completed his fellowship in endovascular and skull-based surgery there as well. Uh, before coming here, he has obtained 10 patents already this early in his career and has over 30 peer review publications. Um, and I'm happy to welcome here, him here to talk to you today. Thank you, thanks Peter. Oh, I think Peter was my chief resident. So um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be, uh, to be colleagues again at Mount Sinai and uh, I'm honored to be here um, this evening with all of you. And uh, I really welcome, oh, wait a second. I'm gonna have to mute myself. I'm on call. So I think this may be something coming. Give me just a second. Sure. This is what happens, everyone, when you have working neurosurgeons who uh, want to teach. <laughs> Just a reminder, while he's taking that call, this is intended to be interactive, so feel free to speak up and ask questions, or if you don't feel like it's an opportune time, you can also ask questions in the QA box. Um, I'm promoting, because we don't have a huge group tonight, I'm just promoting everyone to uh, panelists so that you can easily unmute yourselves and ask questions as you wish. And if you don't wanna be a panelist, feel free to decline. I might call on you for questions. Um, no, no, this is meant, this is really meant to be value added for whoever's on the, um, on the call tonight. And uh, I'm happy to make it as interactive as possible. I actually thought Pete um, that uh, I might switch to my to my phone after the slides and um, and show people around the lab if that if there's time for that and if that ends up being being interesting. Canned can laptops are uh, they're good, but you know they don't tell the whole story. Um, yeah, I guess the first thing I will say since we're since this is real life is that um, as as Peter said, uh, you know you have to kind of multitask sometimes. It's not always ideal, but it's life and um, that's, that's the way it goes. So forgive me if I have to pick up a call in the middle of the talk, I, I apologize. Um, Pete, it's okay if I share my screen now, right? That'll work. Okay, okay. okay. I can. Can people see the screen? Looks good. Great. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, about what we do here at Mount Sinai Biodesign, and it's intended to be um, uh, a little bit of a um, a little bit of a showcase of things that we're currently doing and um, intend to be doing and have been done in the past. And a little bit of what I hope you'll take away uh, from this evening is that. Um, uh, it's possible to kind of innovate in a structured way, and um, there is there is a uh, there is a path that um, innovations take in uh, in in the journey from concept to real uh, real impact, and um, and it's not really haphazard. It can be done in a in a well defined structured way, and I'd like to give you a little bit of insight into how we do that here um, at at Sinai Biodesign, and. The, uh, the term biodesign um, was coined at, at Stanford. So Stanford has a, has a, cent, a biodesign center. Um, and there's actually, can you, I don't know if you can see my, I can't see my camera, but I'll, can you see my camera? This is, there's a textbook, which is now in its second edition. Hopefully you're seeing it um, on the screen there. 
It's called Biodesign, the Process of Innovating Medical Technologies. And it came out of the Stanford um, program. And if you're interested, I, I recommend it. I mean, it's not really it's not really a thing you can kind of read through cover to cover, but it, if you're interested in medical innovation, particular medical device innovation, uh, I think it's a great resource to know exists and to dip into from time to time, um, because not only are devices themselves and software engineerable, but the process of how to innovate is also um, engineerable. And, and we try to follow a pretty disciplined process here at, at um, sign up out sign and I want to give you a little bit of insight into that um, you know some of you who are here tonight may wonder you know if I have a, if I have an idea uh, for an innovation for a device for a piece of software or uh, some other new paradigm um, you know how do I take the first step how do I take all the steps necessary to try it out and um, and, and see if it has legs and and there are all kinds of resources and networks of people that you can delve into. And, um, and uh, there, are, there um, is a lot to learn from what we've and others have done. And I hope that I'll give you a little bit of insight into the process um, tonight. So uh, Mount Sinai Biodesign um, started out as a rapid prototyping center. So it was basically a uh, machine shop located in the basement of, um, of Mount Sinai Hospital. And um, it has become over the last five or six years, um, and I'm only here six months as the new director, but, but, um, but it has become a, uh, really a, um, an incubator for um, medical device innovation within the healthcare system. And Mount Sinai um, is a healthcare system that spans multiple hospitals in, in New York City. And so, although the center is, um, was sort of set up by the Department of Neurosurgery and is run by a neurosurgeon, neurosurgeons. Uh, we really interact um, extensively with surgeons and doctors from all over the healthcare system. And that makes it particularly interesting because as you'll see, not everything that comes through us um, is, uh, is neurosurgical. But our, our job and our goal is to, um, to try to help uh, physicians and surgeons who have ideas for innovation figure out um, whether those are uh, ideas that can become products that can be spun out or licensed uh, as real um, products that can really impact patients and to translate those um, ideas from concept through prototype to um, to real technology that that enters um, enters the clinic. So um, I want to try to show you a video rather than just talking in theory i just want to show you something practical at the very beginning to give you a sense of the kind of things we do so this requires a little bit of explanation before i show you the video so um you know in in, in medical technology especially early stage medical technology there is a whole ecosystem um for how things get built and how things get regulated and approved by the fda um, and how they get trialed in clinical trials in patients, uh, and ultimately how they become real products that enter the marketplace and, uh, and help patients as kind of standard of care. And there are all kinds of people and institutions and companies that, are, that play roles in that. And, um, and I'm, what I'm gonna show you now is, is an example of how we at Sina Biozine have played a role in, um, in, in one such process. So this is a, this is, um, a session in which um, we helped a an early stage startup, well, I would say a mid stage startup that is developing a, um, a minimally invasive device for repairing the mitral valve. Um, and this this company, uh, I won't say too much about it out of respect for confidentiality, but this this company is developing a device that is meant to repair damaged mitral valves. And um, it's preparing for its first human clinical trial. Um, the first time that, that this device will be uh, implant, will be used in a human patient. And in order to do that, um, this company has to, train, has to train surgeons from different parts of the world, from New York, from uh, Paris, from Frankfurt. Um, it's not clear which, where, which country uh, the first patient will be enrolled from. But all of these, uh, all of these surgeons who are involved 
um, need to learn how to use this new device. So um, how does that happen? H how do surgeons learn how to use a new device that isn't really even um, out in the marketplace? So uh, the, the company, uh, along with um, an organization that, that we collaborate with, Switchback Medical, which is what's called a contract research organization, CRO, um, we set up a simulator. And that simulator you'll see here um, involves a, uh, a human cadaveric heart, which we can instrument uh, with, with various um, sensors and cameras. Um, so I know this is supposed to be kind of neurosurgical, but I'm, I'm showing you something that is a collaboration with cardiologists and uh, interventional cardiologists and open, open cardiologists within our institution. Um, I, I do also endovascular neurosurgery. So the, the collaboration is, a is sort of natural uh, on the endovascular front. But um, so you can see here, I'll, I'll rewind the video. So our collaborators at Switchback Medical um, have a have an arrangement by which they uh, they can receive human um, human donor hearts when there is not a recipient. So uh, so those hearts can be used for research. And you see that here on on the table here. It was frozen and, and brought over to to us in preparation for this experiment. And we set up a whole interventional suite uh, in the in the lab here. So what you're seeing here is a, is a C arm. Uh, for fluoroscopy, which is projected on this screen here, I'll show you later. But this is um, this is a, a Doppler ultrasound, which is uh, looking at the chambers of the heart and the valves. And uh, and here you're going to see um, an endoscope that's been inserted um, into the heart, so you can see the valves opening and closing using live video. And as I mentioned, so this is an international clinical trial that we're setting up for. So um, the this is a German surgeon who came to do the training in, in with us in New York, and um, this we're, we're able to stream this training to France and Germany. So here is the um, the human cadaveric heart, which we've which we've hooked up to um, peristaltic pumps. So every every part of every chamber of the heart, every great vessel is hooked up to a to a saline pump. So we're not pumping blood through, we're pumping saline through um, to simulate the action of the heart, but in a way where we can actually. Um, we can actually instrument it and see what's going on. This is an endoscope that's been inserted transapically, and you'll see the, um, so you can see we actually can make it beep. Um, this is a pressure tracing. So as an aside, we have our own devices here, one of which working on in collaboration with, um, with cardiologists, interventional cardiologists here, which is a valve pressure sensor. So you can see the pressure tracing here live. I managed to test it alongside their other device. This is our, this is our device being tested in the, um, in the aortic valve, so you can see this the pressure sensor on the tip of this catheter. Here is, and this is the end. Which, what this is what the endoscope is seeing uh, inside the left ventricle, looking from the left ventricle at the at the aortic valve as it opens and closes. And this um, is the view as seen through the wall of the heart from the outside in uh, using an ultrasound. And this is our this is a, another camera that wasn't being used that's just looking at our team um, in the lab. So anyway, this is kind of like a so it was something we did a couple weeks ago, real life um, experiment. And uh, and it just gives you a sense of the kind of collaboration that we do here. And, and I think it kind of encapsulates in some ways um, how early stage innovation happens and what is unique about uh, what we do here. So um, in a sense, there was a startup involved. There was a contract research organization involved and, and, there, was, and there was us. And one of the things that is unique about about us as, a, as an incubator for medical technology startups is that we have um, immediate access to physicians and surgeons who come through the lab um, each, and every, each and every day. So, um, you know, in this case, I was, I was able to help set up the, the clinical sort of surgical simulator side of this. And um, it's rare, you know, you'll see if you, if you interact in the world of med tech startups, typically, uh, um, you, you know, there are, uh, it's rare for engineers to have close, closed loop collaboration with physicians. And um, you'll see, in my view, this, this is one of the most critical aspects of successful medical technology innovation because it's hard for um, peer engineers to know uh, what the clinical need is and, um, and how devices are gonna be used. Because unlike, um, unlike uh, you know, say consumer electronics and other areas where, um, you know, technical innovation uh, is done, um, you know, in, in many cases, you know, in software and consumer electronics, 
the end user and the engineer can be the same person, right? You can test a piece of software or you can test a piece of consumer electronics as if you were uh, the end user, if you're, if you're the engineer. But that's not the case in, um, in uh, med tech. You, you have a patient and you have a doctor in the loop. And, uh, and if you're not closely aligned, um, all three of those parties, the engineering and the clinician and the patient are not in close collaboration. It's very hard to, to innovate successfully. It's easy to kind of go off the rails. So one of the special things about what we do, and I was just kind of trying to show you an example of that, is we, we bring all of, those, all of those parties together under one roof um, at, at Sinai Biodesign. So our mission here is, is really to enable um, physicians with good ideas to test them out, um, to, to either to be able to fail early and quickly, um, or to prototype things and get them into a into a pipeline um, that will get them out into the real into the real world, and that involves a variety of stages. Um, but first, let me just tell you that um, innovation, you know, happens uh, not in a box; it happens in a team of people. And um, we have kind of an incredible team here at Manhattan Biodesign. We have um, surgeons, we have uh, engineering PhD students and professional engineers. Uh, we have some MD PhD students, uh, and we have a professional project managers, just like you would have in any um, in any engineering in any heavy engineering company. Um, so we run it really kind of like a combined mashup of um, a hospital combined with a uh, with a, a tech a tech startup. And um, you know I can't take credit for a lot of this uh, because much of the success happened even before I before I took over. Um, but just to give you a sense that this model over five, six years has produced uh, really some meaningful successes. Uh, more than 75 faculty members over the years have come in with, um, with projects that have made it uh, in, in some meaningful distance. Uh, we've filed um, you know, 26 technology disclosures, a number of which have resulted in patents and pending patents. And um, we've actually spun out a couple of startup companies with others uh, along the way. So, um, so for example, there, there was the first company to be spun out is a company called Monogram Orthopedics, uh, which, which is an orthopedic company that, that custom prints uh, joints to a patient specific anatomy. Um, and we have, uh, we have two more, maybe three more um, on the way in the, in the coming year. A um, whole bunch of patents and, uh, and, and several um, sort of deals in progress with the industry. Um, one of the most interesting things that does happen, as I mentioned, is we have industry collaborators who come in um, and, and they, they appreciate the fact that we, have, uh, that we have both kind of clinical insight as well as engineers in-house. And so I'll just show you something um, that's uh, hot off the press. Let me just make sure I, I can see what you're seeing. So this is a um, this is a hemostatic valve. Um, this is this is a, the, the product of one of those collaborations that, that I just want to show you. So this is a hemostatic valve, and um, I don't know if you if people are familiar with this, but basically, you know, anytime you have a catheter-based in, intervention, especially interventional radiology, you know, you have you have a catheter that that flows angiographic contrast and and blood flows through the catheter. I see people nodding, so I'm sure you, you get what I'm saying. So so. There are certain constraints that those that those that anything that hooks up to a catheter like that needs to needs to meet, and in particular, usually you have um, saline flushing through one port um, into that catheter on and off, and then you have to instrument um, through the catheter with wires or other devices, and so you need a, a valve that's a hemostatic valve that opens and closes that stops the flow of blood and simultaneously allows you to flush saline through so that their blood doesn't clot in the catheter. And this is not a new problem. You know, this has existed for years and years. In particular, it was, you know, it was these these things were developed by by cardiologists. But um, you know, we had we had some some new ideas about how to make a better one uh, in in the lab here about a year or two ago. And um, and we were able to three D print you know the first several generations of, of prototypes. So what you can see here here is a, a valve that I open and close with my with my thumb, and uh, and you can. I don't know. It's probably camera's not quite right, but you can you can see how it opens, right? The lumen opens, and then if I let go, it closes down. Is that is that clear on the camera, right? So this mechanism is kind of new, um, and and in particular, what's what's neat about this valve is that um, I don't have to really move my hand position to uh, 
to actuate the valve. Some valves you need to open and close by switching your hand to the back. Um, and, and we care about bubble entry. In, in particular, when we do procedures in the brain, we never want any bubbles to, to form in the valve or in the catheter. And so you can see this is, this is clear and both, both parts of the Y um, can be constantly visualized while the valve is, is, uh, is in use. So anyway, you know, small kind of detail things, right? But, you know, that's what a lot of medical device innovation is, is, is these small, these small details. So this is just one, one, one product we're working on. This has probably gone through like, I don't want to count, but many, many iterations to get to this. Every little part, every little curve that you see was iterated. This actuation mechanism was iterated many times. Um, and uh, we have a, a partner, um, Merit, uh, which is which which specializes in valves, probably world leader in valve. It makes millions and millions of valves, uh, medical valves each year. And um, and they and we, in collaboration with them, have been have been iterating this prototype. Hopefully, it will end up on the market, you know, within within the year. Um, but that has been a close collaboration in which uh, we and they share ideas. Our um, surgical team, every every single every single one of my colleagues, and there are ten of us, um, you know, has had hands on all of these prototypes many many times. And that iterative process is what has resulted in, you know, in, in this design, which hopefully some version of which will go into production um, uh, in, the, in the near future. So that's just an example of how um, it would be basically impossible for, um, for something like this to be developed without extensive um, physician input. And so that doesn't happen, just engineers don't just do that on their own, right? It's this, it's this combined, uh, feedback loop of collaboration with with industry that lets that that lets that happen. So that's one of the kinds of things we do. So I want to talk a little bit about the process of um, of how uh, of how medical innovation um, happens. And I think I showed this earlier, but I think I saw some new people hop, hop on. So this is the book I was mentioning before, Biodesign. I take no credit for it other than that I like it, and we try to abide by it here in um, Biodesign. But um, but I, I do recommend it, and if you're interested in this subject, it's it's probably the Bible of the of the field, and I, I do recommend it. Um, and so so what are some of the tenets of the biodesign process? Um, probably the most important uh, are listed on this slide. Um, maybe the most important is this concept of needs identification. So you can engineer almost anything. You can build almost anything that you can imagine once you identify the specifications. You'd be surprised at, 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 at what you can build or what can be built. Um, uh, really complex stuff. But the question is, does it, is it what you want? Is it what you need? Right? And, and that sounds almost like a simple question, right? Like, what do you want to build? Why do you want to build it? Um, but actually, in, in many cases, that ends up being the more complicated question. Um, what does the patient need? You know, what does the surgeon need to serve the patient? Um, those end up being really nuanced questions. And then does the market need it? Will people use it? You know, are there, um, are there uh, hurdles, um, regulatory or uh, financial or otherwise, that will prevent it from getting to market um, or really being practical to adopt? So those things need to be thought about very carefully um, before even you start building. And so we spend a tremendous amount of time working with uh, physicians and surgeons who come with ideas, trying to answer these questions. You know, what is the real clinical need? Um, what, is the, what was the real clinical need and why? And then um, once we have kind of identified the need, then we start to brainstorm ideas for how to address the need. Um, all different kinds of design ideas. Um, and, and within the lab, we have um, some pretty extensive uh, prototyping resources. And that makes it possible for us to sort of try things out, test things, iterate, fail, try again, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and, and a certain amount of that can be done in-house. And so I use this um, valve as, as a, just as an example. So, you know, this, um, you can see like, the, uh, you see that um, the kind of the, the uh, this plastic part that is more opaque 
than the rest of the valve. So different manufacturing processes were used to make the different parts of the valve. So um, this part here uh, is a standard part. It's, it's basically injection molded. Um, but this other stuff here, the, the opaque, the more opaque uh, parts were 3D printed. So um, the 3D printing, uh, various, various kinds of 3D printing are, are pretty readily available now. And we 3D print all kinds of stuff uh, in the lab. And you can, you can iterate on 3D printed designs pretty quickly. So that's a great thing to have. Uh, we have all different kinds of materials that we can 3D print in and we can, um, and we can easily kind of iterate it, right? So, so one of the things that we, that I'm using this valve because it's, it's at, at the same time, it's sort of like a simple example, but it encapsulates a lot of the things that we, um, that we do successfully because this, I mean, knock on wood, this valve at some point will be actually really used in patients. And so, um, it, 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 it gives you a sense of, uh, of how the innovation cycle works. So these parts, so this curve, for example, that fits, that fits my finger, right? We, we iterated that so many times, right? The angle of this, of this inlet, we, we changed that multiple times. The actuation mechanism of this uh, back part of the valve, we changed many times. And the way this center part opens and closes, we changed that many times too. So um, the ability to have physicians lay hands on it, um, figure out what they like and dislike, what works and doesn't work, and change it quickly in response to that um, is what allows the project um, to, to move forward. But at the same time, you know, for this to go really into production, you don't 3D print these parts when you mass produce them. So we have to work with the production engineers to figure out, well, um, if we, what, what are the essential things that we, that we want, right? Because actually there are, there are, there was, there were versions of this valve that we made that were actually not manufacturable. They had all the features that the surgeons wanted um, and we could 3D print them, but we could not make them at scale. We couldn't give them to an injection molder, for example, the kind of things that are used to make these millions of, of these parts, the clear plastic stuff that you see. Um, uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't injection mold exactly what we wanted. So then we had to go back, talk to surgeons, identify what we, what we really needed that was, that was essential. What did everyone agree was essential and what were the things that could be modified so that we could actually manufacture um, using a process that can make you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of devices. So, so that just gives you some insight into how that process works. It is iterative and it requires taking a lot of things into consideration. Um, in, in this slide, I wanted to, I wanted to maybe give you one piece of advice, um, which, which is uh, a piece of advice that was given to me years ago. And um, in the end, I couldn't control it, but I luckily it happened. Um, and that was that if you, uh, if you want to be a surgeon and a scientist. Um, try to locate your lab as close to the operating room as possible. And, um, and uh, we have done that with Sinai Biodesign. And I, I just, it, that's really just lucky for me because I, I didn't have anything to do with that, but it, it did turn out to be very fortunate. And this slide is meant to, to show that. So the interventional radiology suites, I'm speaking to you now from, from right here, this or this room over right here. And the interventional radiology suites where I do a lot of my clinical work are just around the corner. So uh, I'm, I'm in the lab, in the suites, in the lab, in the suites, multiple times per day. And um, the engineering team that I showed you, most of them live here um, when, they're, when they're here in, at work. And then upstairs, um, we have an, another outpost of the biodesign center um, just around the corner from the main neurosurgical operating rooms. So um, there's a really sort of seamless ability to move ideas and people um, in and out of the lab. And I would say unlike many places, um, a lot of the engineers uh, and the non-physician people who collaborate with us, um, you know, they, they are very comfortable getting into scrubs, getting dirty, getting into the operating room, the operating personnel know them. And um, it's just it's just incredible to be able to work in, in that kind of closed closed loop uh, communication type environment because it lets us move um, pretty quickly. Um, another thing I'll say that, um, you know, on the, on the subject of, of uh, working as a team is that, you know, you, you, you probably 
know, you've heard, you maybe you yourselves have done this, um, that uh, there is this concept of intellectual property that happens when you're working with new technology, right? You want to file patents and protect your ideas uh, along the way to going from idea to company or licensing deal um, or, you know, manufacturing process. Uh, that's an important part of, of the innovation cycle. And um, that can be complicated when you're working with an academic institution uh, like a hospital or a university. Um, and as part of our team, we have a close relationship with um, the intellectual property office at Mount Sinai, which is called Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. Um, Phil Williams is the liaison there. And, and I probably talk to him every day if, or every other day. Um, and this concept of protecting intellectual property and negotiating license agreements with other companies um, and, and figuring out how to work the deals that will spin out startups around devices that come out of the group um, are uh, it, it's essential. And if you, if, if, if you do not have a sort of robust relationship with your partners in, in these capacities, um, it can be a roadblock. Um, but when you do have good relationship with these people um, as colleagues and trusted colleagues, friends on some level, um, the, 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 the innovation process is much smoother. And I guess one other thing I wanted to talk about on the subject of, uh, I forgot almost, this thing is sitting on my desk as a reminder to talk about it and I, I forgot. Um, so I mentioned that um, we have uh, the ability to do a lot of 3D printing and that we, uh, we work intimately with the operating room personnel. And one of the services that we, provide that's um, clinically relevant. And if some of you come and do sub eyes here with us, which I hope you will, um, maybe you'll experience this. Uh, Dr. Morgenstern and I have been talking about this and uh, but I want to show you. So, so we can 3D print patient specific anatomy. Uh, you guys may have seen stuff like this before. So this is a, this is a real patient. Um, this is, a, is a, a skull model that was printed from a real patient's um, scan, took the DICOM files and printed the skull. And we have a printer um, in the other room that can print um, in multiple colors. So this is all the same material here, actually. It's just different colors, but you can see we have, um, we have tumor in gray and we have sinuses in pink and, uh, and then obviously bone in white, right? And we can do this, you know, in a matter of hours for basically any patient. So this is, this is good for the surgeons um, and it's good for, for us, uh, as um, you know, as educators, and uh, and it's good for patients too. Who want to kind of get an understanding of what it is that they have going on and what we can do for them. Um, so, but this this is not just you know we use the three D printing not just for making prototypes, but also for um, understanding what the prototypes are going to be used for, uh, as well as a variety of, of other things. So, um, yeah. I think this has been these models have been incredibly useful to us for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and maybe one other piece of advice I would give you uh, is um, regardless of what you do, you know, um, I think 3D printing is a is a skill that is probably useful to acquire on some level. It's not really that hard to get the basics. There's a lot of 3D printing resources out there. Um, and it's sort of is becoming one of those one of those things that's just uh, a useful skill to have. And um, you, you'll find all kinds of uses for it. It's not a, it's not really like an esoteric thing anymore. Um, many of you have probably done it on some level before, and I would encourage you to, you know, take an online course or, you know, read a Wikipedia, you know, how to on it, um, and and try it out on some level. Uh, if you come here, I'd be very happy for us to show you how to do it. Um, I think we will try to. We are trying to set up. Um, a little teaching module so that the sub who rotate with us will be able to to do something like this with a case that they uh, that they observe and find and find interesting i think you find that when you um explore the the 3d um when you explore the 3d yourself uh in a way that you really spend time interacting with the models um you develop a much more robust understanding of the anatomy yourself um, and I can say, you know, having having brought these kinds of things into the operating room for complex cases, they do make a significant difference. So anyway, just a just a little piece of advice there. I, I saw a question from one of the panelists: What modeling pro programs would you recommend for three D printing? And um, maybe the easiest 
the easiest uh, CAD program to use is Fusion 360. There is a um, there's a freeware version. If you're a student, uh, you can you can basically have. I think it's I think it's pretty fully functional. Um, so Fusion 360 is a, is a good. One. I mean, SolidWorks is like the standard. Um, does everything CAD program. So if you're at an institution that has a um, that allows you to have an institutional subscription to SolidWorks. Go for it, um, but but the the freeware version of Fusion 360 um, they make fully functional for students because they want when you when you grow up they want you to buy it. Uh, so okay, what else do I have to say? Right. So you know, I mean, one of the missions here is to is to um, is to innovate and to get innovations uh, from ideas into the real world. And I, I've tried to give you a little. Um, a peek into some of the things we we do to make that happen, and um, but of course you know another one of the missions is to train people to um, to bring innovation to innovate and bring those innovations from idea into the real world, and um, and we do that in a variety of ways. But I would think I think one of the most important ways uh, that we do it is is through our um, our graduate students. And um, Fred Kwan is an MD PhD student who finished his PhD about a year ago and is now in his third year of medical school. He's an expert. Um, on the artificial intelligence and modeling side of things. And Turner Baker is a PhD student. Um, I hope we'll be able to keep on the faculty here, uh, who's an expert in clinical trials and, um, and other aspects of the uh, clinical innovation process. Um, we also have, and I would encourage you to participate in these at your respective institutions. We have, um, I don't like the word hackathon, but that's sort of what these developed out of. Um, they're, they are um, programs that encourage innovation and, uh, and bring surgeons and doctors into um, contact with medical students and graduate students who are interested in device development and software development. And these are programs that, um, that basically present clinical needs. So I think one of the most interest, one of the most, the only way to learn to innovate is to try. You know, and um, many times you will try and reach a dead end, and sometimes you'll be able to work out of the dead end, and sometimes you won't, and then you try again. Um, but most important is to be working on something that is a real, really important problem. And um, and uh, these programs, whatever they're called, where you where you're in school, they probably exist, and there there are great ways of getting people together, getting talented people with different viewpoints together uh, around really important pressing needs. And um, in particular, I would say that over the last two years, COVID has, has driven a tremendous amount of innovation, especially here in New York City. And the, the pressing need and the needs of various um, doctors from different specialties getting together has resulted in a huge amount of innovation. Um, for us, uh, we have one device in the group, for example, that, um, that, that will hopefully be licensed by a major company that was a that was developed out of a need to keep patients and surgeons safe in the operating room. So um, the group figured out a way to uh, to protect against aerosolization in surgical procedures, aerosolization of virus from the oropharyngeal cavity. Um, you know, that's just one. That's just one example, right? But um, that that necessity is the mother of invention is is true in a certain way. Um, but putting some structure around that is really helpful. And um, these programs are ways for you to meet. Uh, other like-minded people and people with talents that you may not have. Um, so I encourage you to participate. And we also have a um, have a fellowship program um, it, at Biodesign where um, we uh, we bring we bring in um, people with interest and experience for a year or two years um, to uh, to live in the in the um, in the Biodesign Center to focus on one or pro one or two projects with the objective of um, going out the other end as a CEO or a CTO. And this is not necessarily uh, you know, a program for exactly for you here on the call, because most of you are going to go into, you're here because you're going to go into neurosurgery or you're aspiring to go into neurosurgery. So you're not going to you know, be a full-time CEO or a CTO, but, um, but you will need to work with people like that. You know, if, you're, if you're an innovator and you have ideas for devices that you want to get out into the world um, and you want to be a surgeon, uh, you're going to need to build a team. 
and you need to learn how to work with teams. Um, you know, you can't do everything yourself. And uh, so, so these, these are the sorts of programs that I would encourage you to participate in, whether it's at, at our place or at yours. Um, and just to know that they exist and they exist all over the place. Uh, they, they, they go by different names and, and at Mount Sinai, they go by biodesign, but you'll find them elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe I'll just say a word about, we have, New York is kind of an incredible place, right? It's a huge city with tremendous uh, deep resources for, for talent and a lot of different institutions. And Mount Sinai is interesting because we're a huge hospital system, but, we, um, but we're not a university in the traditional sense. So we don't have our own engineering school and our own law school and our own business school, et cetera. So we have to go outside of the institution to find um, those talents. And, um, but they're here in, in New York, it's a big city and, uh, and New York City has connections to um, other institutions throughout New York State. And so um, uh, these two students, for example, Denzel and Tyree are new PhD students in our group from Rensselaer Polytech, um, which is a major engineering school uh, near Albany. And we have a variety of collaborations all over the city. Um, and uh, I hope that some of you at some point will spend time here um, if that seems like uh, it's, it's, if it seems like it's piqued, piqued your interest. What else can I say? I, sh I showed you these uh, full demos. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll give you a few, a few other um, insights into things we do. So we, I showed you that we have these uh, 3D printing capabilities. What do we use them for? So um, one of the things we use them for is um, to build surgical training modules. So this, uh, this something like this model, um, we use to simulate a, you know, a skull that you can do a craniotomy on. And uh, we can also fill it here. This, this one is empty, but we can also fill it with, a, with an injection molded soft material that simulates brain. And, uh, and we can simulate tumors or hemorrhages in, in, inside of the brain. So uh, this project here, was a, um, a project to help train surgeons in minimally invasive hematoma evacuation. Um, so Integra, which is a company that, um, that specializes in, among other things, in, in products that do that, uh, um, we had a joint, a joint project with them where we, uh, we made the models that they used to train surgeons uh, to do that. And, and similarly, we have another, uh, we have an endovascular training module um, for helping uh, surgeons in endovascular um, surgeons learn how to use uh, liquid embolic agents. So here in this in this figure, you're seeing kind of a, a simulated vascular malformation that we can flow. Here we're not flowing blood; it's just it's just plasma without the blood cells. But still, um, it provides a, a simulation in which we can flow fluid and plasma, and um, and allow surgeons to understand the dynamics of how the liquid embolic agents. Um, uh, solidify and uh, and f follow the flow. We're expanding the facility, so if you come to us in two years, hopefully we'll be twice as big. And um, you know we have a huge number of of projects going on at any at any given time. Um, and I, I won't I won't tell you about all of them. I'll just sort of show you the show you the pictures. And I realize that we, we we've gone on already for forty five minutes. And I would love to um, to uh, answer questions and. Um, and I'm happy also to virtually show you around the lab if people are interested and I can get my phone working. Thanks so much, Ben. If anyone wants to speak up with questions, otherwise you can, uh, if you want to set up our tour, that would be great. I'll, I'll set it up while we, while we talk. How's, how's that? Perfect. Maybe some of the people in the lab will be around, which, which I would say, you know, the, one of the most fun and interesting things is working with amazing people. Uh, I hope you find that to be the case, you know, in your lives too. And uh, that has certainly been, been the case here. And engineers are great people to work with. Dr. Rappaport, I had a, a question for you. Thank you for your talk. Um, as someone who works in like in like one this major engineering center and also gets the opportunity to perform these crazy surgeries do you feel like there is there is sometimes a disconnect between what is known 
in the field, like what technology you know exists and what technology surgeons know exists and how to apply it. And how do you go about identifying gaps in the field and trying to adapt new technology to it? Like for example, using this cool 3D printing thing for a hematoma evacuation, you know, where, do, where does the, how do you know when you're just looking for an idea to work versus when you've actually identified a big need in the field, when you're working with something worth so much money and working with something that has like near endless contributions to the field? So um, Max, thanks for the question. And uh, you know, you, you've worked with us um, on some level, so you kind of have an in, some insight into, into how we do things. Um, but let me see if I have your question right. So you're saying, um, is there sometimes a gap between what can be done and what surgeons know can be done, right? So like tools that exist and surgeons may not know about them. And um, at the same time, maybe the sort of the flip side of that is, uh, you know, how do you know whether if you have an idea, it is like a really good idea with a huge market and potential to have a major impact uh, on, on the field or whether it's not a great idea and you just think it's a great idea. Right? Is that are those sort of the two sides of the question? Yeah, um, I guess with, with, with so much, with so many possibilities out there, with so many new technologies being developed every day, um, where do you even begin to search to see if what you have is novel or has been done already? And how do you set about improving it when there are so many labs just like out doing this all across the country? Sure. Yeah. How do you know whether you have a new idea? That's that's a good that's a good that's a good question. And um, and there are, uh, there are, you talk to people, okay? You, you talk to people and you read. And, um, and I would say, don't be afraid that you're gonna, that you are gonna give away your idea and someone's gonna steal it. Okay, that's maybe another piece of advice I can give you. Like a lot of people think that if they have a good idea and they talk about it, it's gonna get stolen, right? How many people have heard that before? Um, yeah, pretty much everybody, right? Um, and there is some truth to that. Uh, you know, it is definitely possible that if you talk about your good idea, someone will steal it or steal some version of it or scoop you or whatever. Um, but you kind of just have to, my advice to you, more nine times out of 10, is to talk with people you trust and respect about your idea. Because a lot of times, your idea is not the complete story. And other smart people who thought about similar things will give you more ideas, will help you work on it, will be excited to help you work on a good idea. Um, uh, and uh, and we'll think about things that you haven't thought about and will help you along the way because most things you can't do in, in isolation. And, and if you never talk about it with people, especially people you trust, it actually won't ever go anywhere. You'll just, you'll just think like, oh, I had this good idea once and I could never get it to work because I never talked about it. You'll hear surgeons say that all the time. You know, you'll, you'll hear, oh, you know, I had this idea for something and no, 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 I always wanted to do it. And this or that reason for why it never had. So Max, number one thing is like, just, just to try to find experts and talk to them about it. Um, but also, you know, there's a ton of literature, you know, uh, you know better than me at this point, probably how to search the literature, the pet, there, there, there's, you know, it's easy to go into the patent literature, either through the patent office or through Google Patents to look at what patents have been filed on a particular topic. It's easy to search the scientific literature um, and it's easy to search the web. And uh, between those kinds of searches and speaking to experts who you know, usually if you speak to somebody, they'll tell you, oh, speak to somebody else, oh, speak to somebody else. And eventually if you're persistent, you'll find the right people to talk to. And that's how you figure out whether what you're doing is novel and, um, and what, to figure out whether it's a good idea, you can follow a similar process. At some point, ultimately you have to bite the bullet. Right. Either you've ruled out that it's a bad idea and you drop it and move on, or you think it's probably a good idea and you pursue it. And you never can be 100 percent sure until you get a certain distance down the road. And then to your other parts of your question, uh, yes, there are technologies out there that are not used yet that are waiting to be applied. You know, like 10 years ago, 3D printing was one of them. And now 3D printing has, has crept into every aspect of what we do. Um, and uh, and then there are, you know, cool technologies that are just hard to apply and those abound.
think we have another hand raised for a question. Mohammed, if you want to oh, ask, go ahead. Go for it. Yes, awesome. Uh, Dr. Rappaport, thank you, sir, for the, uh, the great talk. So my question was, how does one go about, I mean, after you've, uh, you, you've made your device and you have clinical data showing its you know, advantage over you know, current technologies, how does one go about um, attracting, uh, I guess, the attention of industry? Are there conferences you go to for this to, to show the product or how do you go about that? Sure, yeah. So I tried to, hopefully this didn't come across as, as too scattered. I tried to show you a little bit of everything. I tried to show you you know, working with startups, clinical trial, preclinical stuff, early prototyping, ideation, intellectual property. I tried to show you a little bit of each and, and to give you a, um, you know, uh, an, an idea of where to go, um, you know, to the biodesign process to figure out how it's all, how it's all structured. But then this question, which you ask of, you know, how do you actually find a commercial partner? Right? That's the question. It turns out to be easier, much easier than you would think. Um, when you have all of those elements, by, by the time you have, um, by the time you have a prototype that's working, and you've tested it in cadavers or you know an animal model, um, almost certainly you know who in the device world is interested, mm. right? I mean, there are half a dozen huge device manufacturers in this country and more um you know in europe uh and most of them have have um you know product lines in multiple fields and also a network of suppliers and smaller companies that they deal with and almost nothing that you do uh is completely in a box in isolation right so suppose you invent a device for you know uh for head and neck surgery, you know, an endoscopic device or something that's used by sinus surgeons, you know, or suppose you'd invent, you, you, will, you will know that there are four companies out there that market devices in that area. Mm. And you can write to the business development groups in those, um, in, those, uh, in those companies, and usually you'll get to the right person. And more often than not, the right way to do it is to find somebody who's worked with the business development group in those areas, like a surgeon at your institution who works with them, and they'll make the introductions, and uh, and and you'll meet the right people. When you have something that's of interest and that's working, you, you'll find you'll see it's 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 actually hard to get something to work in the real world, you know. Um, and so it's rare, right? And and so these these companies hear from doctors and others all the time, um, but most of the time it's half baked. So when you have something that really works. Uh, and that solves a real clinical need, they tend to listen. And it helps if you approach them through somebody who already has credibility, but chances are you're one or two degrees of separation away from such a person. And by the time you have a device or a piece of software that's relevant, you, you'll, you'll already have established a little network that gets you, in a, gets you the right introduction. So right now it may seem abstract and far away, but um, once you start working, you'll see that it's much closer than you realize. And honestly, the people that work at these companies, they're just normal people. Their job is to, most of the time, is to get products, you know, get products that work into the world. So they like to hear from you if you have something really important to say. Here, I'm gonna move to my phone so we can keep talking, but I'll, I'll just show you where the magic happens, just, just for fun. Um, one second. You, you may have an echo for, for, for a minute, I, I apologize. Am I? Uh, Am I uh, there, uh, there we go. Uh, there we go. How's that? Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, great, great. All right, so I switched. You, I switched to my phone. Let me um. Let me turn this video off. Let me put. I need to spotlight your. You need, that's right. You need to spotlight my phone. Okay, here. I, I, I can I can do it. I can do it. I just need to find you. Right. There we go. You are, you are spotlit. Okay, great. Okay, here, here. I'll show you guys. So this is. I think this is pretty cool. This may seem mundane, but it's. I think it's pretty cool. So, um, not wearing a mask, but luckily there's no one in the corridor. All right. So this is this is the corridor outside of Biodesign. 
it looks like a regular hospital corridor, but we have the closest, the lab that is closest to uh, procedural suite, I think, in the entire hospital. So maybe I walked 20, 30 paces. So this is interventional radiology. This is, these are the neuro, the neuroangiography suites. This may seem trivial to you, okay? But so this is where I spend most of the day. And uh, it may seem trivial to you, but um, I advise you, strongly advise you, if you can swing it, uh, try to get your lab as close as possible to where you take care of patients. It'll make you so much more efficient and, uh, and more accessible to your team. So that was a lucky, that was a lucky stroke. And this is, this is the lab, here we go. Uh, here, let's flip, flip, flip the camera, bio design. Here we go. This is where the magic happens. So we have, I'll show you, I'll show you the 3D printer that uh, I made those skulls. So here's our, here's our uh, little museum of various printed skulls and things. This is the, uh, this is the printer that prints in that sort of talc material. You can see uh, this is sort of this talc material that we print from. And these cartridges, uh, they're not loaded right now completely, but uh, you can see they print in the primary colors to get those different tissue colors that you care about. For those of you who are um, interested in this kind of stuff. So this is the old, anybody know what this is? Just out of curiosity. Anyone know what this is? Is that a CNC machine? Oh, good work. Yeah. So this is um, this is a CNC machine. So it's like the opposite of a 3D printer. Nobody uses it anymore. We inherited it from. Uh, I'm kind of sorry to say nobody uses it anymore. Um, but we we inherited it from the uh, the previous occupants of this lab when it was a prototyping facility. Really before 3D printing kind of um, became so popular. Um, so, you know, CNC machining is like subtractive manufacturing and 3D printing is additive manufacturing and that's the way of the world now. This is, uh, this is post-processing. So I won't show you everything, but I'll show you one thing that I think is kind of cool that we do. So, um, so this is, a, uh, this is a, an injection molded brain um, that we made here. And uh, here are the molds. So it's like uh, frozen frozen uh, frozen brain so this is this this we um, this is the uh, is the the uh, the positive that we make the negative mold out of to injection mold the silicone Does that make sense we keep it in the freezer um, so this this is you know it's a different material from the uh, from the 3d printed um, bone type materials uh, it's soft and squishy like like brain. So this is this is the the same basically the same model that we used with Integra to do the uh, to do the surgical training. I see that we're getting. I mean, I could, I could show you tons of stuff from today until tomorrow. We have many more three D printers. We have all kinds of other toys. But um, I want to respect that we used up the hour. I'm happy to stay a bit if uh, people want to hear more. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Morgan Stern will put my contact information up uh so you can, you can be in touch if you're if you're interested in spending some time here or if you want to reach out with questions thanks for your time today thanks for your time sorry my fault. My fault. Got it. okay there you go Thanks for your time tonight, Ben. This was really, it was a great session. Does anyone else have any other questions before we call it for tonight? All right, well, thank you everyone for attending. Next week we have, um, we tentatively have Dr. Gatan doing, uh, uh, giving us a talk on neuromodulation for epilepsy. Um, if, uh, there is a possibility that we may have to reschedule that session. So just check your, check your email boxes toward the end of the week um, with, an, with an update from us uh, just in case. Um, but looking forward to seeing you all at our next session. And thanks again to Dr. Rappaport for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Good luck to everybody.